Speak, O Lord, to us as we worship you here at Harlandale Christian Church. Welcome to our time of worship and fellowship as we seek the Lord and as we seek and ask him to speak to the needs of our lives and our hearts. The, de the psalmist David uh, knows, knew that God spoke to him and walked with him and he sought him as he wrote in Psalm 51, O oh God, create in me a pure heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. David could simply say, Speak, Lord, I'm listening. And so today, as we worship the Lord, we say, speak, Lord, to me, to us today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your presence here among us. We have gathered in this house to worship you, to fellowship with each other, but to, to draw near to you through your spirit and because of your son, our gift that you've given to us your grace and mercy through your son, Jesus. Father, speak to us. Lift us up. Encourage us. Help us to know your word and your will. Bless us. Receive our adoration, our worship, and our praise as we lift up our voices and our hearts to you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, then time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore. And the roll is cold up yonder, I'll be there.
As we come to the time in our worship service that we gather at the communion table, the Lord's table, to partake of the, the Lord's Supper, even as Jesus instituted or celebrated the Passover meal in that upper room just before he went to the cross of Calvary. We're reminded by these emblems, the, the bread and the cup, that this is a, a remembrance of his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his promise to come again. But we also know that this is a part of God's plan, his purpose, his way to offer salvation and redemption to us, to all of mankind, so that we could accept his son, Jesus, as Lord and Savior so that we could recognize the majesty of God and the majesty of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and come to him. The writer of the book of Hebrews in, in chapter 6, beginning with verse 17, reminds us, because God wanted to make the, the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us might be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, that is the Son of God, where Jesus has entered on our behalf, and he has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. He offered himself as the sacrifice, the sacrificial lamb, the, to take the place of the, the lamb that the high priest would offer on the altar one, every, every year, once a year, for the atonement for the rolling forward, the accountability of the people's sins. The Hebrew writer says that Jesus has taken the place of that high priest and that lamb. Majesty. Oh, majesty. Here I am to receive your grace and mercy and your love. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege that we have of gathering at this Lord's table to partake of the bread and the cup, to remind us of that supper that Jesus shared, the Passover meal that Jesus shared with his disciples. There in that upper room, even knowing that he was about to go to his death, the cross. How majestic, how loving, how gracious and merciful, because he also knew that he would rise from the grave and then ascend into heaven with a promise to come for us, to receive us, to redeem us. Thank you for these emblems, Father. Thank you for the remembrance. Thank you for the mercy and the grace. We pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. We want to read from John, the uh, 
the, the Gospel of John today to consider Jesus' statement, I am the resurrection and the life. So if you want to turn to John, the 11th chapter, we're going to read verses 17 to 27. Verse 17, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the, the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Verse 23. Jesus said to her, your, bro your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Verse 27. Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this word, this message of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. I hope, pray that you help us to open our hearts and our, our minds to your spirit to give us understanding of your message for us because we know that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Speak to us, Father, today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, today we're going to do something unusual. On Easter Sunday, we're going to consider a, a text that's not about Jesus' resurrection. Did you know that Jesus was not the first person to be raised back to life after they died? Because the Gospels record at least three people that Jesus himself raised from the dead. Jairus' daughter, the widow's son, and Lazarus the brother of Mary and Martha. Now this is the, the incident and the story that we're going to look at today. And this is where Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Now friends, here's the significance of this. On Easter, we're not just remembering and celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. We're also celebrating and recognizing our own resurrection. Now last week we left Jesus and his disciples on the other side of the Jordan River. This was the desert region where John had originally been baptizing people. And the text there implies that things had, had heated up in Jerusalem because of Jesus' confrontations with the Pharisees. So they had to get out of Dodge, if you will, for a little while. But John chapter 11 opens with a, a messenger coming to Jesus and the disciples. Uh, and a came, he came with the news that a man named, La named Lazarus was sick. Now Lazarus was the brother of Mary and Martha. And they lived in a town called Bethany, just outside of Jerusalem. These siblings were apparently very, very close to Jesus. And he stayed with them when he was visiting Jerusalem. But when he heard the news of Lazarus' illness, Jesus inexplicably chose to stay where he was for two more days. In John, I mean, yeah, John 11 and verse 4, he says, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. So after two days, he said to his disciples in verse 7, let's go back to Judea. And his disciples tried to talk him out of it. In verse 8, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you're going back? And Jesus responded with something similar to what he said back in John chapter 9 and verse 4, 
I must do the work of the Father while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. And then in verse 11, there was this curious conversation, this exchange where Jesus said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. And his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. And as usual, the disciples really missed the deeper meaning of what Jesus was saying. So he told them in verse 14, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you might believe. Let's go to him. Our friend Thomas responded, let us also go so that we may die with him. Now, friends, it's not clear whether Thomas was referring to Lazarus' death or he feared that Jesus was walking into a trap. And as a disciple, as a follower, maybe he was saying, if Jesus dies, let's die with him. But sometimes in the scriptures, people say things that have, have meanings far beyond what they intended. Thomas' gloomy comment was more profound and prophetic than he could possibly know. These disciples needed to experience a death and a resurrection just like Lazarus. And friends, so do we. So do we. we have to die to an old life in order to be, to be born into a new one. And the work of the Holy Spirit in us is to wake us up to this new life. What life is meant to be talk, to be all about. So I share with you that today's lesson, when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, we could probably say that this lesson is about double meanings. The first, Jesus speaks of two kinds of sleep. In Mark chapter 5, in verses 39 to 41, Jesus raised Jairus' daughter. He went in and he said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, and he went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kume." which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Jesus used this metaphor of sleep to describe people that were actually dead. For him, these two states were interchangeable, indistinguishable. What did he know that we don't know? Maybe what we call death is more like finally waking up from this long sleepwalk that we call life. A second thing that Jesus teaches us in his statement, I am the resurrection and the life. He says there are two kinds of death. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 in the first six verses says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of, God, of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. The same John who wrote the gospel said in Revelation chapter 3 verses 1 and 2, Jesus' words to the church at Sardis, You have a reputation of being alive, but you are really dead. Wake up. Strengthen what's rem what remains and is about to die. Now friends, these passages describe a kind of living death. 
or a zombie-like state, if you will, that many of us might fall into. It's dreadful, it's terrifying to think about the truth of being alive, breathing, but also being dead. Jesus also uses a double meaning by talking about two kinds of life. In the fifth chapter of the Gospel of John, in verse 21, Jesus says, For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. And then remember in John 17, in verse 3, in Jesus' prayer in the upper room, where Jesus said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Author Thomas Merton says this in one of his writings. Life is this simple. We are living in a world that is absolutely transparent and God is shining it through it all the time. This is not just a fable or a nice story. It's true. If we abandon ourselves to God and forget ourselves, we see it sometimes and we see it maybe frequently. God shows himself everywhere, in everything, in people, and in things, and in nature, and in events. It becomes very obvious that God is everywhere, and in everything, and we cannot be without him. It's impossible. The only thing is that we don't see it. Now, friends, how many of us have read or seen Thornton Wilder's play, Our Town? In that story, in that play, Emily discovers the joy of being fully alive too late. After she's dead, she pleads with the spirits to allow her to return and to look in on one day, just one day of her life, one last time. And Emily picks her 12th birthday. But she's sad as she recognizes how little the people that she loves really comprehend the joys of life or experience them with any depth or any awareness. Emily cries to be taken away so she doesn't have to watch any more of their inattention to the preciousness of life. You might remember her parting words are, Goodbye. Goodbye, world. Goodbye, Grover's Corners, Mama and Papa. Goodbye to clocks ticking and Mama's sunflowers and food and coffee. And even iron dresses and hot baths, sleeping and waking up. Oh, Earth, you're too wonderful for anybody to realize you. Do any human beings ever realize life while they live it? Every minute? Journalist and author Fyodor, Fyodor Dostoevsky, who wrote and lived and wrote during the 1800s, told the story of his conversion. He was raised as, as an Orthodox Christian, but he tells this story of what really changed his life, and he recognized he was born again. He says he was arrested by the czar in Russia and sentenced to die, but the whole thing was just a cruel joke intended to traumatize people who had rebelled against the regime. They were blindfolded and they were lined up to stand before a firing squad. They heard the guns go off, but they felt nothing. And then, one by one, they realized the guns were loaded with blanks. He says that the whole experience had a profound effect on him. He describes waking up the morning of this mock execution, 
just knowing that it would be the last day of his life. As he ate his last meal, he savored every bite. Every breath he took was, was breathed with an awareness of how precious breath and life are. Every face that he saw that day, he studied with intensity. He wanted every experience to be etched into his mind. And as they marched him to the courtyard, he felt the warmth of the sun on his back as, as never before. Everything around him, every blade of grass had a magical quality about it. He was seeing the world as he had never seen it before. All of his senses, he said, were heightened as if he were fully alive. And then after the experience of that fake execution, his life was never the same. He became grateful to people that he had previously hated and mistreated. He became thankful for everything about life, but especially for life itself. He was born again. I am the resurrection and the life. And now, the rest of the story. Jesus speaks to Martha and she expresses a kind of faith that's familiar to every one of us. She says, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus assures her that her brother will rise again, she says, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And then Jesus gives this startling response. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe, do you believe this? Friends, do you believe this? Do we? Now again, apparently Jesus was possibly speaking of two different kinds of life and two different kinds of death. So next, Jesus speaks to Mary. She expresses the same level of faith as her sister. If you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But this time, Jesus is deeply moved by her tears and asks, where have you laid him? So friends, Jesus speaks to Lazarus. First, he silences Martha's objections to remove the stone. Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Next, he prays to the Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always heard me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And then he calls out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Friends, this passage shows us the real meaning of Easter. Now we'll celebrate Easter in a couple of more Sundays, but the message is here for us today. The message of Easter is here for us every day that we live in Jesus Christ. God's creation starts now. Friends, the meaning of Easter is not primarily about life after physical death, that, that, that because Jesus came back to life bi biologically, therefore we will too. Nowhere in these accounts do we find his early followers saying, Jesus is risen from the dead. Therefore, we're going to heaven when we die. It's not in these three accounts. The resurrection narratives in the gospel and the stories told by Jesus himself point beyond just the reanimation, the realivement of dead bodies. Think about Jesus' story of the prodigal son. Upon realizing that he had reached the bottom of the barrel, that young man resolved, I will arise and go to my father. At their reunion, the father exclaims, For this my son was dead 
and is alive again. And then just to be sure that we don't miss the imagery of a resurrection, the father says this again as he restates his joy to his other son. Remember the passage? For your brother was dead and is alive again. This son had not lost and regained his biological existence, but he had laid down on the deathbed of shame, fear, and broken relationships. He had cultivated an overwhelming sense of separation that, that produced bitter fruit of disgrace, anguish, and loneliness. When the son took responsibility for his actions and he honestly faced up to the consequences, Jesus says that that young man arose. Isn't it interesting that this is the same word that the New Testament consistently uses to refer to Jesus being raised and his resurrection from the dead? So friends, arising could have a double meaning. It points to a greater, broader, and deeper resurrection than just the biological reanimation living again. What difference would it make for a dead body to regain its existence if the, if the person remained filled with anger, bitterness, arrogance, hatred, anxiety, resentment, hostility, and blame? Think about it. Repeating those same patterns in a new outer shell would be like slapping a fresh coat of paint on a broken down jalopy. It might look good, but nothing of substance has changed. No, friends, the glorious message of Easter is what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, Just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. Friends, the story that God is telling is the story of the renewal of all things. And it's already begun. We participate in it through death and resurrection now. And it happens when we say yes to God's invitation to new life and we follow Jesus to the cross and we accept Jesus the Christ as our Savior. And that cross, once an instrument of torture and death, becomes a symbol of joy and beauty as God gives us new life, new joy new existence in him and in his son. Our song of de decision and dedication today is a hymn that we, we freq frequently sing at funerals, but it's interesting that we sing at funerals, abide with me, when really those words are asking the Lord to walk with us while we're still living. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall never die. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the power of you living in your son, Jesus to show us in the miracle, in the words, in the events surrounding the death and the resurrection of Lazarus, we see Jesus, the resurrection and the life. We see your grace and your mercy. We see your power and we see you and your son Jesus walking with them when they are alive walking with us when we are still alive. I am the resurrection and the life. Thank you for those words, Father. 
Help us to fully embrace and live out the truth of our new life in Christ today. We do live because Jesus is risen. We're already seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We walk in the newness of life because he has conquered death. And he and you, through your Holy Spirit living in us, give us life and joy and peace even today. Abide with us, resurrection and life. Help us to live in your joy, in your peace. In Jesus' name, amen.